Hey, Robert. Um, we appreciate you all being here. And the second part of this, if you all, <coughs> excuse me, my allergies are horrible. If you all would like for us to work with your department individually to help you come up with a standard rubric, then we are more than happy to do that. Just shoot us an email, uh, contact the teaching center, and uh, we're happy to work with you all to help you do something. This is actually a suggestion from a faculty member in a session we did last semester. She said, this would be great if we could get everyone in our discipline on the same page. So just let us know if you would like to do that. And so let's keep our fingers crossed that I can actually, ooh, there's our PowerPoint. I'm so excited. Okay. So, and I'm not sure how to get this, wait, will that do it? The, uh, the little um, coffee inverted thing <laughs> to the left of the. Oh, we're just having it like this, Robert. I'll never be able to find it, I don't think. Um, but if you go to slideshow and then uh, from the beginning, that'll work too, up at the top. Okay. Um, this is unfortunate right here uh, where it says slideshow show next to um, just a little menu yeah. menu in the menus at the top slideshow menu okay here we go it was covered yep. by my thing all right here we go you play from the beginning and there you go okay got it my um zoom uh menu or whatever the legend up here was hiding it Okay, so Robert is going to talk to us a little bit about rubrics and our perceptions of those and just reflect for a moment. So take it so, away, Robert. Yeah. Not to, uh, I don't want to make anyone feel like a student, but this is sort of the same way that I get students thinking about their paper topics, et cetera, too. And that is with a little self-reflection. And so when we're making any kind of rubric, the first question we have to ask ourselves is, you know, what, first of all, what do I want this rubric for? What do I want it to assess? Like, what's the purpose of having it at all? And when you write down what the rubric is about, what, how you, what your experience is using them and how you want to use them, that gives us an idea of how to move forward. Do you have a good idea of what, how a rubric functions already? Or is this based on maybe a negative experience that you had in college when we were in college? <laughs> um, and is that something that we need to overcome? So I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is the barrier of why you're not already using rubrics due to a bad interpretation of how rubrics can be used um, based on it being used poorly in the past? Um, so in that relation, in, or in relation to that, uh, does anyone have any thoughts that jump to their mind right off the bat. This is my view of rubrics. This is how I see them being used. This is why I don't like them. This is what I do. Well, um, one of the reasons I uh, joined you all is that we have a, or I have a rubric in one of my courses that several of our instructors teach for analyzing data that we have, that the students have to calculate for uh, financial statements. And one of my problems with rubrics is setting up the point system because it, you know, if they miss one or two things, it always seems to come in, you know, like at a 50% or something. Okay. And, you know, I, I need some help with that. And right. also just maybe clarifying the criteria so that it's easier to grade. Great. So yeah, effectively, you're already halfway there because you already see where the problems lie. You know, obviously, this point breakdown isn't uh, working well, or it's not justifiable, and that it's not reflecting the grades you think they should get based on the work that they're putting out. So then we know where the issue is. We need to we need to have a much more streamlined point system, and we need to have a more clearly defined criteria. So already, we already know where we're working from. So that's great. Um, and that's and that's what I mean. And in really really realistically, if you know you, you want to do this on your own at some point, this is where I would start with that too. What's my view of this rubric? 
where do I see the problems? What do I need to work on? And that can lead us to, well, what is this actually assessing? And that'll help us with that criteria. So I'm kind of a big blank page. Um, I implemented a HIPS uh, in my nutrition class last spring. And um, it was a service learning project that had to be converted to a research project after spring break because of COVID. So all of a sudden I had to create a rubric for a research paper and I have uh, never taught English. <laughs> I've never, I didn't have a clue and went on the internet and got lost. Like there's 10 million rubrics um, on the internet. Indeed. And so I came up with something I do not think, I think it confused the students rather than enlightening them. And I felt horrible about it because that was my fault. Um, so I really would like to know the basics if that's not going to bore everybody else. Um, nope. I think that what you just said is, I mean, basically what this slide is talking about, right? Is that mm -hmm. if we look at the definition of a rubric, a rubric is a coherent, coherent set of criteria for students' work that includes descriptions of levels of performance quality on the criteria, right? Which seems simple. And like you said, there's tons of rubrics online. So for those people who are just Googling it, pulling down rubrics, Unfortunately, those rubrics aren't very good because they don't normally describe any level of performance, which I think is probably where uh, Ms. Powers' uh, issue is coming in too, is that lack of criteria, clearly defined criteria. Um, and that I think is the problem with pulling things offline and why I would encourage any instructor to write the rubric themselves because realistically, you are the one who knows what you wanna see and your class is never going to be exactly the same as even another exact class. You know, even if, you know, Gracie's 1010 and Karen's uh, uh, biology 1010 are two different biologies realistically, because you have a different way of teaching, a different thing that you're looking for, a different way that you're presenting it. Which isn't to say that there can't be a standardized rubric, but that we need to know exactly what we're looking for and why. And then we can start to look at, well, what's cross, what's cross correlating? What do we know that absolutely has to be there? And then we can start breaking down those levels of performance with the language. So go, uh, if we can go to the next slide. So these are the three questions that, I, that help us get there. First, what are we evaluating? Uh, we need to know specifically and succinctly exactly what we're looking for. What is it that we're evaluating? Um, how detailed do I want the grading to be? You know, so for Gracie, what, what, and depending on what that hip was that you added, what, how specific and how detailed is it? Is it just a, okay, you did A, B, and C, so it's passing, or is it, well, we have multiple steps that you need to get these things right? Um, because those are two different levels of detail. One's more of a, say, a participation grade. The other one being, you know, full-on final paper. Uh, those rubrics look pretty different. And what are my priorities for successful writing? I'm assuming for you guys, you're much less focused on grammar than, say, I would be. <laughs> and that's important, too, because ultimately you're the one setting the weight. You probably want it to be in complete sentences, though. So there's probably still gonna be a criteria of writing, but maybe all I'm really grading for is, is everything written in a complete sentences? And this is only 10% of the whole rubric, not 50% or 25% like maybe I would do. Here's an example of uh, one of our sections for our English 1010. I know it's kind of small, sorry about that. Um, but you can see where we break down even uh, content. This is just one section of our final essay rubric. And within content, we break it down. Okay, well, that includes the topic, the thesis, the rhetorical statement, literary analysis, uh, support, and critical thinking. So I would encourage you to think about the sub-concerns, if you will. So the cap content is the primary concern, but then we hit break those down into the individual parts that make up the content. So if we're looking at rubrics, uh, so for instance, Grace, do you, so I can use it as an example, what was the HIP practice that you, you put into your course? Um, it was, uh, sorry, it was a nutrition class. So they had to convert their service learning, which would be like volunteering at food banks, et cetera, et cetera. 
into a research paper. Um, is that what you're asking? Yes. So, so, so some of my class, it was all over. I didn't really limit it. In retrospect, I should have. Um, so some of the students actually came up with recipe books, um, but they had to do a reflection and they also had to explain how, you know, the, the science behind the recipes, like the nutritional values and stuff. Some of the students came up with public service projects, such as um, one student did a bilingual pamphlet of where to reach out if you're, uh, if you have food insecurity. Okay. So, so like it was, it was a way like I, I was so over my head. It was awesome, yeah. but it was scary. Like, so with that, with that, I'd say a, a well-written uh, rubric would probably help limit the, the scope as, okay. as well of like all the different projects. So for instance, I'm not sure how I'd grade those two things the same way. I, um, yeah, I learned right? that too late. <laughs> <laughs> and so for instance in that first example you gave you talked about nutritional value so right there i could say okay well we need a section in the rubric for reflection a section in it for research and a section in it a section in it that explains the nutritional values right those are the three important things that you listed so within those three things then we'd break down you know okay what is a good reflection what needs to be in there and is it um this is where I began. This is where I ended. Here's my critical reflection. Here's what I learned. Does it need to have complete sentences? Does it need to be in first person, right? So we can look at just reflection, part of that document, break down exactly what you want to be there. And then we'd look at the gradation. So for instance, if I said, okay, well, they need to have a self-reflection before they begin or, or how they felt about it before they started. Now, what does a, uh, an F version of that look like? And what does an A version of that look like? And we need to break down each step. Does that make sense? Uh-huh. So, You're I mean, that's, it. And, that's, and that's effectively what would I, would first of all, make it a lot easier for your students to know if they're on track or not. Mm -hmm. It would limit the scope of the project so we know that we're not getting wildly different things. And also, when you go to grade it, it's like, oh, well, I can clearly see that they're at the C level in this reflection because I asked for five sentences and they wrote three. And then in the experimental uh, where you're weighing in on the uh, data and talking about nutritional values, did they present accurate data? Did they present it in the right format? Is it an APA, right? There's that, then we can break that down too. What does success look like in that category from F to A or from one to five if you if you want to put a numeric value? Because a lot so a lot of this stuff is going to be arbitrary. It's just a matter of breaking it down and defining it. And that's why I say I really would prefer or my my advice would be to even a science professor, you know, write at least or 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 at least break it down yourself. Maybe not write it yourself, but at least break it down yourself uh, so that you know and you're, you're verifying that you're asking exactly what you're looking for. And realistically, you're gonna be the one that knows that even more so than me or anyone else. Well, well I, I wrote it all myself. I just used the others as a template. It just, it was not good. And uh, if you want, obviously the, these PowerPoints are available to you guys. I, like, I really like this slide because it breaks down, first of all, criteria, then the gradations, which is what I'm talking about, one to five or eight, uh, F to A. Then the descriptions, effective rubrics often use descriptive language. The rubric describes exactly what the assignment quality is or what it makes it uh, a good quality assignment. And it tells the student how to perform and verify and comprehend those scores. Like if they, if they want an A, it tells them exactly how to get there. This is what it looks like. Um, not to mention continuity. And this is like, once we look at this across you know, all, once we create a good enough rubric that everyone in biology 1010, for instance, could use this rubric, then students start to see that continuity across courses. They understand how it works. Uh, but I also do want to talk about reliability, which is that a good rubric should be able to be used by various teachers and have them all arrive at the similar scores. 
So not that every teacher would have the same exact rubric, but if someone were to come into your class, a different science professor, and use your rubric to grade your students, that they would come to the exact same score you did. Um, or at least close, right? Not, not maybe not the exact same, but at least close. Um, because if it's... I'm so sorry. I just wanted to interject that one thing that we've done in the English department is have norming sessions, which mean, and we haven't done this in a while, but we sit in a room and we look at samples of writing and then we each score those and then talk, see how close we are. And this helps us stay on the same page in terms of the, a student's not getting an A paper in one class and a D paper in another class. So if you do decide to adopt something that your department's going to use, it might be interesting to do that. Just get together, have a norming session and see how close you are on your evaluations. Sorry for interrupting, Robert. No, you're fine. Um, and the last one I, I, before we move on really is validity. And that is a rubric, uh, when a rubric possesses validity, scores, uh, you're scoring what is central to what you are assessing. Not necessarily what's easy to look at. Oh, it's formatted wrong, F. And I'm saying that from an English perspective, as I've seen instructors who, who grade that way. Oh, it's not an MLA, F, because that's easy to see. But then I'm like, well, isn't that only 25% of the grade? I'm like, well, yeah. And I'm like, then it can't be an F. That's at best, a, that's, a, I mean, maybe all the other stuff that's wrong with it makes it an F, but if that's all you've evaluated, it's still at a C, a mid C. So if you've written them off as an F, you're not even following the rubric. Um, and so that's one of the things that I, I encourage, you know, so if you, you in science probably aren't going to be grading the way I would for writing, like I said, so it would not be that we would weight that at 50% if that's not really what you're grading for. And so I'd, I'd encourage you to think of those scores and situate them in such a way that it makes sense for your class and for your division, um, where the emphasis is much more on the science than it is on the writing. The value of rubrics is that it lets students know specific expectations. Uh, if you've been in a lot of these sessions, we've talked a lot about equity and deconstruction when we talk about the syllabi and how a lot of this you know legalese or uh, uh, jargon from the educational system doesn't really give access to the students. These rubrics can really help bridge some of that gap because they can see this is, if I write like this, it's an F, but if I write like this, it's an A. So I wanna write like this. That's what I have to do. Um, it makes it much simpler for them. And what I found is when you when you show the students the stakes and how to get there, they get there. It's not a lack of desire. It's a lack of knowing how to get there. And the rubric kind of helps bridge or give them a map. Um, it may standardize assessments within disciplines or across departments. Again, as we start to cross pollinate or as you start to spread these rubrics out across uh, other um, professors, like Valerie said, we had those normal normalizing sections where we would talk about how we're grading them and make sure we're all on the same page. And it allows instructor to incorporate learning objectives into the grading criteria. That's one of the best connections that, it, that rubric help, rubrics helped for me when I started making good ones, at least, took a while. Uh, but it allowed me to start directly connecting the assignments to the outcomes of the class for the students. Hey, this isn't just an essay for an essay's sake. Here's an essay where we're learning how to do this thing that you have to know to pass this course. And it made the connection explicit. And two, I always like to plug Tilt here, but it fits nicely in with this because with Tilt, they have specific instructions for everything and they know in detail how they're going to be assessed. Yep, and so that, and a lot of the benefits of and of tilt and the benefits of rubric go together really well. They 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 complement each other. Um, so some of the pros of using rubrics is that they provide students with clear expectations for assignments. I can't stress how how much that matters to them. Um, students may learn from the rubrics ways they can't learn from a letter grade. Just getting a B doesn't necessarily tell you what you need to fix for the next one. A rubric clearly shows you 
I missed this section, this section, and this section. That's where I need to improve. The rest was fine. Just makes it much less confusing. Rubrics define what quality entails. They know what a level looks like. They are quick, objective, and efficient. That's my favorite one. <laughs> They're quick, efficient, and objective. Makes it so much easier to grade. Um, it's a little bit more work on the front end, but the back end is so much simpler. Uh, rubrics make justifying scores to students much less tedious. My second favorite. Uh, like I said, since I've gone to this style and really expanded it into the portfolio system, I've had zero grade appeals. And when students come to me and say, well, I didn't understand what we were supposed to do, I can say which part. Point to it. And I'll show you how to do it. Uh, and if they go, well, I don't know, well, then I know they didn't read it and they didn't, you know, and then we need to start all the way back at the beginning. Um, the gradations on rubric allow students to identify their strengths and their weaknesses, to learn from their mistakes and to know what they're, but to also know what they're doing well. And I can't stress, especially for students who are underserved, how much knowing that you do things well matters. Um, and rubrics provide students with detailed feedback about that assignment, not just a you passed or you failed. Students often become more objective and thoughtful judges of their own quality of work, meaning they don't have uh, a, a, a grandiose sense of their own importance and accomplishment <laughs> uh, that is not attached to reality. Um, a teacher is able to stretch a rubric to reflect work of learning support students and gifted students, so that's where you can stretch it here and there, it allows you some space. And rubrics require teachers to clarify their focus, expectations, standards, and goals. The oh, one thing turn, oh, I'm so sorry. The stretching, what is that? Could you clarify? So, uh, let me find where that is. I'm really sorry. I just, that really struck me, but there's a huge variability in our classes. Right. So, what I do is, for instance, if I say, has presented a cogent uh, critical argument or something like I'm making up words. Um, but, you know, so for instance, in relation to an essay, uh, created a strong persuasive argument. I can say if I know a student is struggling and they got it, I can say that's a level. Whereas a student who already got it, but could clearly make it better. I can push them and say, well, you're not quite there yet. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. That makes sense. So it allows me that space where I'm I'm still grading everyone on the same level, but I can recognize someone who has, say, um, more of uh, experience with English, more experience with essay writing. I've had some students who, especially, come from homeschool, and their mom is like a, a English professor or something, and they come in and they can already write at the level that most of my students will finish at. But that doesn't mean that they're perfect. And I don't believe in grading on a curve, but they still should get challenged. Otherwise they're not, or they're not gonna keep coming or they're not gonna see the value in it. And this allows me that space to keep challenging them without creating that sort of, okay, well this person's way up here. So the rest of you either make it or fail. And it allows us to grade students without judging uh, from the top student, which is, you know, I know that for instance, happened to me when I was in college is like, okay, well this student is up here making a 97 on everything. So you only get a three point curve. It doesn't matter that the rest of you are down here at 60. Sorry, you fail. And that idea of being judged against somebody else just A, doesn't make sense. And it's just not good pedagogy. Um, and so that the rubric allows that space. Sorry, it took me a while to, to wrap my head around the question. Uh, much longer than it should have. Uh, my, my, and the last point I'm gonna make is that um, the one that I was surprised by on this list the most is that how much rubric required me as the teacher to clarify what I wanted, what I expected, and what their goals were, and where I hadn't. And I was just kind of assuming and expecting those things, uh, which is not good for any student. Is it me yet, Robert, or are you still? I think so. Okay. 
So there are some downsides to rubrics. And as Robert said, initially it does require an investment of time. But once you have that, then it's done. That doesn't mean you can't go in and, and tweak it, but it, it does require some time on the front end, but it does provide an objective way for you to measure student success. And sometimes explaining the rubric and the difference between say maybe A work and B work can be challenging. And in writing, the easiest thing that we do is to give examples of student papers. This is an A paper, this is a B paper, this is a C paper, this is a paper that did not pass. Um, and so once you start this, students may want rubrics for all of their assignments because it lets them know on the front end, here's what we, here's what the instructor expects of you. You can use this as a checklist to make sure that you've completed all of the elements of the assignment. But again, once you get the work done, you're good to go. Um, so you can choose, there, there are some different types of rubrics and one is analytic. And so that is when I show you the um, grading, the rubric for writing here in a moment, we'll see that. But in the snippet earlier from the writing course, we have the, uh, each criterion listed, those match the learning objectives. And so each section then is graded for certain elements. And in doing this, we get some diagnostic information. It gives formative feedback to students and it's easier to link the areas of success and areas of improvement back to the rubric more so than a holistic grading rubric, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, so a student then could look and see in which section there needed to be some improvement or in which section that student had great success. Maybe the organization was really strong, but the content uh, wasn't exactly on task. And this type of rubric does require more time in terms of grading because you are looking at details. Um, with holistic grading, uh, we used to do this in English to assess students for learning support, but <clears throat> I'm so sorry. You look at the assignment as a whole, and that doesn't mean that you don't have criteria, but you're not breaking it down into sections. You're looking at either the effectiveness of the assignment as a whole, and you may have four elements that you're looking at, but you give the student a score, for example, one through five. And in my experience, students are not um, holistic grading especially for writing students is a little bit difficult because they want a letter grade or they want to know exactly where uh, their grades have panned out. But this is a much easier way to grade sometimes for minor assignments like a free writing or an opinion. I will use the holistic grading because it's easier and I'm able to give them just some general feedback. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the rubric that we use. And again, this is, while it's discipline specific, it can be adapted for other areas as well, just in terms of concept and um, philosophy. So we tell our students they have this, at the very beginning of the rubric, we explain some things that aren't in the rubric chart itself. And so that way the student knows, so here's some extra things that I need to look for in terms of grammar and plagiarism. And of course, what we put in the rubric matches the policy for cheating or plagiarism that's in the syllabus as well. And instructors may differ on that. So this is a very, sorry about that. Um, this is a very um, simple rubric. And what I did with my rubric is I took the very complicated one and broke it down for students. For example, students don't really know what rhetorical modes are. 
So I would say the type of writing that you have been asked to do, such as compare contrast. And so this is the first section of the writing rubric that we have. And so here, rhetorical technique, the type of paper. And I do go through and explain this verbally too. Critical thinking skills, what are those? How, how do you define those and what kinds of skill sets do you want to see in the paper? And then the next section we evaluate is the organization and structure. And again, these can have different weights. Um, you may, have, uh, Robert did an excellent job of breaking down Gracie's assignment earlier into categories. So uh, here I've given an example, transitions to tie paragraphs and ideas together. If a student doesn't know what a transition is, then here's an example. Also attributive tags, um, signal phrases. I've given an explanation here of what paragraph unity means. And one of the things too with the tilt assignment is I generally tell them very specifically what I want in the introduction and what I want in the conclusion. So I don't list all of that on the rubric, but they do have it on the assignment sheet. And then of course we have our section, this is big for us, the voice mechanics, editing, the grammar part of it. And academic voice, we explain to them what does that mean? Nobody knows what academic voice means. So we have to talk to them about formal writing. And then in most of our papers in comp one, students are required to do use research. And so this is the section, it's a checklist. They're, sorry, they're going to know exactly what's expected of them. And even though all of this may not be on the rubric, it is on the assignment. Okay, and I think, yep. Robert, so, back to you. And so this kind of just gives us a visual of all the stuff we've been saying, right, up until this point. Um, and this is the basic format that I would encourage everyone to use. You know, whether you go from zero to five or zero to three, again, that's up to you how many criteria, different types of examples you want to give. Uh, this is broken down into inadequate, needs improvement, meets expectations, and exceeds expectations. You might want to put a medium ground in there. Meets uh, is above average, is exceptional, right? So there's lots of ways to go. Usually I do one to five. Um, you can see it broken down into each section on the left column, structure grammatical, language, and content. And so that would really be where we would decide, like in Gracie's document, what really are we evaluating for with this assignment? Do I want to have language and grammar in the same one because I'm not doing English? So it's only going to be once of the four sections. And I want to look at use of statistical data, uh, accuracy of scientific knowledge, and uh, the presentation of APA. I'm making stuff up. I'm trying to guess uh, what, what you guys would grade for. Uh, it's been a while since I took a science class. Um, but that's where we would break those down on that left column. So once we have the, those two filled out, how far we're going to go, inadequate, needs improvement, meets expectations, exceeds, what the sections are, we can fill out then in the middle, okay, what does that look like? So for the structure with exceeds expectations, that is a paper that is logically organized, easily followed, effective and smooth logical transitions with professional format. For structure that meets expectations, that is a paper that has a clear organizational structure with uh, some digressions, ambiguities or irrelevancies, it is still easily followed, basic transitions, structural format, et cetera. So it's really about, I would say, filling out the outside first and then just asking yourself or maybe even as a group with your colleagues. And I actually do encourage you to do that with more than one person. Um, what does that look like? What is something that exceeds expectations for a scientific study? What is meets expectations for a uh, service learning project? Right. Any questions on that? Yes. 
So for holistic grading, this provides an overall assessment of the assignment. It does not provide specific feedback, um, but it can be modified to specific, fit specific assignments. So for instance, if that service learning project isn't that serious, you want them to do it, but it's not a huge impact on the overall grade, that might be more of a holistic grading exercise rather than an analytical one. Whereas if it's a major project, I would definitely encourage you to do analytical versus holistic. Um, I actually use both rubrics in my courses. Um, each individual assignment, sorry about the dog. Um, each individual assignment, I would use analytic. And then what, for instance, when I'm looking at the portfolio as a whole, that would be holistic because I'm not providing feedback on that at that point. I'm just saying they're presenting it to me and I'm saying, yes, it meets it. No, it doesn't. So there are, there are spaces for both. One of the things that I've done in class that's been fairly effective, and it's also created a lot of empathy for me as the instructor, is I have a holistic grading rubric and I ask students, I give them anonymous samples of other students' papers and they have to grade them using a holistic grading rubric. And so it helps them learn how to evaluate other people's papers and then also see how their grades can be reflected in that rubric. And most of the time I get a lot of empathy. How do you do this? But it's an interesting exercise. And this is the type of rubric that would be really good for something of that nature. Yeah. So this is an example of a holistic rubric up here. Sorry. He barks every time there's like a mailman or something. Uh, let, me, let me go stop. <laughs> So Robert does use the portfolio method in his classes. I do not. I do more of a, I look at the rough drafts and then sometimes I will, particularly on the first paper after I've graded it and given feedback, I allow them to do a rewrite and the grading criteria is still the same. Uh, it just really depends on how you want to structure the class. I have not had a lot of success with portfolio grading, but Robert has. And now back to you, Robert. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so this is this is one similar to what I use for the portfolio, as she was saying. And you can see here, critical reflection letter. That's part of my the portfolio. Outcome one, rhetorical awareness uh, and capacity. And this is where they go through each of the outcomes. Select, they they presented to me what they uh what level of that outcome they've achieved, and this is where I would assess it. This is an example of a research paper, a holistic rubric. I don't normally use these for a research paper, but I figured examples are good. Um, but you can see this is um, maybe for some of those writing or assignments that include writing in your classes that maybe you don't want to really assess for grammar, formatting, whatever, a holistic might work better. And we can see here 80 to 100% research paper demonstrates complete understanding and execution of assigned objectives. Thesis statement is clearly stated. It's just more general. Um, and it doesn't provide specific feedback. They know, well, basically I fit into that category, but I don't know how or why necessarily because it's not broken down into individual parts. Of course, this is a blank rubric, like I mentioned before, where we pull out those left and top columns, almost just like a normal table below meets exemplary. This is only three. And then the score, again, that can be five, six, seven, how many ever you want to, how specific you want to be. And then on the left column, we have content organization. And that's just how we break down a normal English rubric, but that's where you would put in um, what is important for that particular assignment what exactly you're looking for. Okay, so questions or Karen, you kind of started out with some questions. Did we help you get to a better place with that? Or would you like to tell us a little bit more specifically about um, what you're trying to assess and, and that type of thing? Well, the project has two problems. And let's say the first problem, you are um, 
calculating um, trend data for two different companies. And then you also have to write um, basically an analysis, like as if you were going to explain this to um, you know, people at work, what the data represents and what it means um, using the data that you calculated. And then there's a second problem where they're calculating a bunch of ratios for two different companies and you're um, picking one that's got the better short-term position and one that it, you know, would be the better one to invest in and reasons why um, you know, it's gotta be a certain length and it has to include the data. Um, you have to support your position you know, whether it's correct or not, but if you support your position based upon your data and it makes sense in that light, then you, you know, would accomplish what you're supposed to be doing. Um, I mean, I, I get people who can barely write a sentence. Um, they don't put any of their data in. They, um, you know, just pull in some stuff from the internet that you know, it's, you can tell it, they're just trying to make it sound good. And it just seems like whenever I add things up, they, they can fail very easily. So sometimes I just start out with like a raw, I don't know, 60% or something, and then use the rubric from there. You know, as long as they're actually turning something in and making an attempt, I start at some point. And I know that's not the right way to do it, but I'm just, I struggle with this. Every time I've used rubrics, it's like, well, you know, this should be really easy. Well, have they done this? Yes. Um, when I used to teach high school and we used to have projects in, um, in Microsoft Office, the checklists were great. Does it have this? Yep. Does it have this? Yep, that's this many points. Does it have this? It's got this many points. But with this, it's kind of like um, a little bit maybe more subject subjective because it's not an actual, you know, does it have this? Does it have this? Because they're actually trying to analyze something, you know. Um, so maybe if I mean, I probably just need to sit down and start from scratch again and lay it all out like you're saying, get more specific. Because so, I know, you know, it's listed, they, they're given in the instructions the things it has to have, but it's laying it out in the actual, um, you know, format underneath the point system that I have trouble with. So uh, I put in the chat, I, I just took some of the stuff you said and typed it out. Uh, uh -huh. And the first one, you said that the first problem. And so I, what I took from your description is there, there's basically three things in that first one you're looking for, breakdown, analysis, and presentation. And in the second one, I got short-term, long-term, data presentation, and support and research as the categories. And again, this is just me kind of spitballing off of what I heard you say. Again, I'm not necessarily sure that those are exactly how you'd break them down. But to give an idea, uh, just based on what I heard, how I would presume they would be broken down. Yeah, um, like, does it, um, did you um, make a choice as to which one you felt fulfilled the requirement? Um, did, it, did you include your data from the problem? Um, did it make sense or support your decision? Did your, you know, your actual numbers support what you said right and then the uh, the last thing was obviously just the organization of it you know is it is it clear i mean does it make sense um does it uh, did you did you have a, a like an intro and a conclusion and um you know can can i read can i read the sentences <laughs> right and so uh, hold on, I had a typo in one of my words, sorry. What I'm hearing, Karen, is almost as though you could take those questions and put them into the rubric. 
because those are that's what you're going to be analyzing or that's what you're going to be grading them on and they then they could also use that as a checklist certainly you could add to that but as i'm listening to you i'm i'm hearing you're supposed to do this 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 and so that might be a good way to start is to categorize those questions into maybe some of the um, categories that Robert's put here, whatever you come up with. Mm -hmm. That way it's gonna be very clear to them. Something even as if you struggle with grammar and organization, did you use NetTutor or did you meet with a tutor in the learning center? And so, the more specific you are there, the easier it'll be for them to know, okay, yeah, I did this, I did not do that. And then you can put some gradations on there. So, and so, I, and like I said, they're just in relation to the data presentation, because you're talking about it, you know, then we'd also, we'd want to say not just there is no data presentation, but well, not necessarily for no data presentation, but for poor presentation, what does that look like? For adequate presentation, what does that look like? For good or above average, what does it look like? And for exceptional, what does it look like? Well, for on my first level, I had does not include data calculated. Right. And, so, so the know, no data is kind of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, second level includes one or two data points. Um, there's another thing where they, on the first problem, you know, if you're saying that the sales went up, they should relate that to other elements in the statement. You know, how, if your sales went up, how does that affect your gross profit or how does that affect your net income? Um, they should at least be able to um, show a relationship to the other elements for the changes that happened. Um, I just, I think I just need to get more specific and so there's, there's two things in all of my research that I've really found, and that's especially in underserved groups, and this is the same issue I was running into, is there's this uh, kind of assumption that they know what should be there, or they know how it works, and they don't. And that's really where the well-defined rubric comes in, because a lot of these students are coming in with no experience. Their, their parents may have never even looked at a college, much less been to one. And so the idea of that they would know how these things work or how it, and, and, or even how it's supposed to be presented is a, an assumption almost too far. Um, and that's really where rubrics come in and it allows those students who are coming in with zero experience, knowing not, nothing about what da how data presentation is supposed to go. I can look at this rubric and get a good idea of what a good one is. Well, we did um, include an example of an analysis not for the problem that we're doing, but for a similar type of problem as an example. And then they, they always ask me, oh, well, do you want me to take this and just put my data in it? Or as like, no, you're not, <laughs> you know, that's an example. It's not related to the problem that you're doing. It's just an example of how you would lay out an analysis, so. And I will, I will also say that um, it's not a, foolproof solution, or it's not an absolute solution, I guess I should say. Um, when it comes to pulling stuff off the internet, uh, plagiarism, if you will, they don't, I would say that they don't necessarily see that as plagiarism, though. That's why I, I refrain from saying that, is it, it, because if you ask them, are you trying to plagiarize this, their answer is usually, oh, no. Mm -hmm. yeah. they, it's just, again, that lack of understanding of how it works, what's good, what's not good. Um, and what we've also found is saying, don't plagiarize or you'll fail, doesn't work. Especially if they don't even know what it is, right? Um, so I also included a little line there. Um, uh, oh, in the quotes up above. Effective researchers and professionals would never use fake data because. So creating this, creating like a culture of an, a professional would never do this because it would sacrifice his career, right? And giving them those ideas is a lot more effective than saying don't do this because they want to see themselves as a professional they want to see themselves in that role as the re the person who has the job <laughs> that they're going for and if they and so if you make that connection well someone who actually has this job can't fake data can't pull stuff off the internet 
so I can't either. Not if I want to be that thing is much more convincing than don't do it. I'll give you an F. Um, I just tell students in as much as you would not walk up to someone and steal a purse, you don't steal somebody else's work because you're a thief. And that seems to bring it down to a level of understanding <laughs> that. Yeah, it's, it's about it's about making it about character. Yeah, I, exactly. And, and, and having them identify with their own character that that's something they wouldn't do in a normal scenario. And I found that that is just way more effective than the sort of penal approach of, you know, I'm going to fail you, I'm going to fail you, I'm going to fail you, you're going to fail this paper, I'm going to fail you for the class. It, it just doesn't make any difference, at least not in, in the way that I've seen it. Well, uh, I'm, we're about out of, I'm sorry, Robert, I keep interrupting you. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I wanted to, because uh, she was kind enough to share it, I wanted to talk about the uh, the final project grading rubric here. Um, I'm going to try to be quick. So I'm going to be honest, without seeing the, the actual assignment, it, it's hard for me to understand what all the the uh, different criteria are mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in Gracie's rubric, I mean. So... I'm going to be honest, I don't necessarily understand everything that's on here, uh, but if you could help me, when you say nutritional content, 15 points total, nutrition and nutritious and delicious, 90 to 100 points, uh, what, is, what is that evaluating? Uh, you're on mute. Uh, Gracie. You're muted. So that would be an A paper, 90 to 100 points. And then on the left-hand column, it's broken down each section and how many points for each criteria. And as you go across, the students were given this across laterally. I taped it together. Oh, um, okay, I see, I see. Yeah, so as you go across, you, the points for each criteria decline. I got you. Now I understand how it works. I was, I was oh, a little okay. confused at first. Uh, and I now that I see they're supposed to be side by side, it makes much more sense. Yeah, I couldn't figure out how to format it where they were side by side and you could read it. Uh, I don't know that you can in Word. Uh, maybe yeah, I don't think it. so. I tried everything. Uh, but anyway, it, it, I just ended up printing them and taping them and giving them. You might be able to do it by making it a booklet, uh, but I'll have to check that. Yeah. So don't don't quote me. But one of the things too that we're happy to do is to either work with a group or work with you individually. If you want to run a rubric bias or get some advice or something of that nature, please feel free to contact us. Well, I did, I sent you an email too. Me? And Robert, yeah. Like Me. right now. <laughs> or when? Like 10 minutes ago. Oh, okay, so I haven't got to, I thought like I thought you maybe I thought I missed it. <laughs> I know. No, 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 no. And I was freaking out, and I thought, did I just disregard Gracie? Did I get it? No, 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 not no, at all, okay, not good. at all. And Robert, actually, I'm glad you said something. I didn't, I didn't think about also including all the other like the description of the project. So I'll send an addendum email that includes that, so you can understand right. it. Because when you, I, and this is not an emergency. I'm not teaching nutrition this semester, but. You know, at some point, if y'all could, somebody could look it over and I'd, I'd love the feedback. I would love it. Sure. Um, sure. And I'll, I'll, I'll just leave you this one thought. So for instance, under nutritious and delicious, number one, question or problem is clearly stated and detailed. It's a great statement.